Good morning and welcome to the data processing course. My name is Ludwig and I'm going to uh, start this first block by giving you an overview of, of the course. So basically the motivation and the, the, the specific goals we want to achieve here. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the, the context of, of programming and why we should use programming for, for data processing and this will also help uh, understand a bit where I want to, to go with this course, so what, what are the, the objectives. And then we're going to jump right into Python, and this is going to be the, the most painful session of, of the six sections, because we're going to start with, the, with actual programming, the basics of the programming language, and then uh, after uh, today we're going to uh, go through all of these elements again and again and again to make it easier, but this first one will be a bit of a shock if you don't have programming experience. So basically the, the objective here is for you to understand enough of uh, uh, Python to be able to use it as a tool. So this is not a general programming course, we're not going to go into theory of programming or things like that. And also it's not a course aimed at uh, having you write a test at the end and so we're not going to go through all the details that you need to memorize. Uh, it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about giving you the confidence and the ability to uh, think about how to put things into code and then look, understand code samples because uh, in practice a way that you're probably going to solve many problems is to Google how to do something in Python and then you understand the code and adapt it. So this is the, the goal. Uh, in three weeks, I hope that uh, you can uh, achieve this, uh, this level of familiarity with the language, that you can adapt code for your uh, problems and think about how to uh, solve problems with code. So don't worry too much about the details. You don't need to memorize anything for a test. You just need to get some practice here and understand how things fit together. So this will be the aim, so that you can write code to automate uh, data processing tasks, uh, so, and this will be specifically your data processing needs. So we're not going to go into how to mm -hmm. devise algorithms or, or uh, analyze problems and things like that, because each of you will already know how to work with your own data. You just need to know how to tell the computer to do the work for you. So this would be uh, our aim here. And also we're going to look at uh, many libraries or a few libraries that are useful for making this work easier so that you don't have to, to handle all the details of, uh, of importing data from Excel spreadsheets or from resources on the internet or uh, generating reports and so on because we have libraries that make those things easier. Uh, so this will be, uh, in general, you will get here the first contact, a, a brief introduction to all these tools, enough so that then it's easier for you to proceed as far as you need in your own uh, problems and, and to find your own solutions, okay? So uh, the daily schedule will be this first lecture from 9 to, uh, it depends a bit, so in general I'll try to make it one and a half hours. Today it's going to be longer than that, at the end it's going to be shorter, so we're going to move for, from more theoretical and less practical to more practical and less theoretical along these weeks. Uh, and then we have the, the tutorial part. Okay. So we break at 1 o'clock for lunch. Uh, this, uh, the, the schedule there in the morning, once I finish the lecture, you, you can take a break and, and take your own time for the exercises and we can, we can discuss things if you have questions. So this is a bit free, uh, more free, but then uh, at uh, 1 o'clock I would ask everyone to, to break there so that we can start at 2, because if some people go to lunch later then we are not all at the same time here and, and it's harder to synchronize. So then we begin at 2 and uh, again we repeat the same pattern. So all these uh, tutorial parts, there are some evaluation exercises for those of you who need a grade. So most people don't need a grade for this course, so in that case don't worry about the, the exercises. If you need a grade, there is one exercise for, for grading, for evaluation, which uh, you must hand in at the end of the, uh, of the semester, so in, in June when you hand in your, your final assignment. Uh, except for the, the 
afternoon on the third day, where it's only reserved for starting the final assignment, so if you have questions about how to do in, in that project and so on. For those of you who don't need the grade, then you, don't, you can ignore this, and we can use this time for me to help you with your own problems, because since I don't need to grade you, it doesn't matter how much I help you because it doesn't interfere with anything. So, unfortunately, there is this incompatibility between uh, grading someone and helping them. I, I cannot do both at the same time. So those who don't need grades uh, are in luck because then I can help with everything. Okay. <coughs> so the first day, uh, we're going to uh, look at uh, the basic introduction to Python, so the basic elements of the language uh, itself and how to work with, with Spider, the, the integrated development environment that we're going to use. Then, in the afternoon, I'm going to talk about how we can import code from other uh, sources, and so we're going to start importing uh, these modules, and I'll, I'll give, as an example, the, the plotting library, matplotlib, and we're going to plot data. So this will cover the, the basic introduction to the programming language, and it's going to be a lot of, of details and, and many things, but it's not meant for you to learn everything today. We're, we're going to go back to all these elements again and again during these weeks, so you're going to go through everything several times. So this is a bit like learning chess. You have to start by learning how the pieces move, and that does not make sense at first, but you need that so you're able to play, and by playing you start learning how the game works. So this is the idea. We're going to learn the pieces of the game today, and then we're going to play every day with them until uh, things start to feel a bit more comfortable. In the second day, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, important libraries that you'll probably use for nearly every, uh, every problem, which is this uh, NumPy and SciPy, which are meant, uh, libraries for dealing with numerical data. Um, and this includes importing data, fitting models, calculating statistics, and so on. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, Pandas, this uh, Python uh, data analysis library that is useful when you're dealing with mixed data, that you, where you have several tables and you can have uh, values that are not numerical, or categories, or strings, or text, or things like that, and you need to, to uh, use those, uh, those data. So basically, by day two, you have uh, a familiarity with the basics of uh, pro uh, the Python programming language and the most important libraries for general uh, use. Uh, and the idea is that then in, in this week, between day two and day three, you can think about your final assignment. And for day three, I'm going to give just some examples of applications to give you some ideas of, of what we, where we can go with, uh, with Python in data processing and some uh, more advanced details if you want to do specific things like uh, fitting your Python scripts with uh, some workflow where you have uh, uh, shell scripts that call different uh, programs, things like that. But, but this will be lighter on, this, uh, on the theoretical part and will be mostly reserved to get you started on the final assignment. So basically things are structured so that we don't end the course when we end the subject matter, because that will not leave you any time to practice and to, to have some guidance applying things. We try to end the important uh, parts of the subject matter earlier so that you can practice a bit until the end of the course. Uh, for those of you who need grades, uh, who need an evaluation, 30% uh, of the grade will be the four out of the uh, five exercises we have. So there are five sessions with a one exercise for grading, uh, the best four of those will count for 30% of the grade. 70% will be your final assignment, and uh, I propose that you send everything by uh, the end of June. So just uh, zip everything in a file, the assignment and the, and the, the exercises, and send to this uh, address here using your, uh, the email address you use for registering in the course, because I have those email addresses and I can uh, automatically assign the, the, the submissions to, to each of you. So please don't send from, from other addresses, because in that case I would not know who was sending the, the assignment. 
these exercises you can complete during the tutorial sessions or at home uh, where, whenever you want, but uh, I can give you some help with, uh, with the assignments here uh, if you have questions. But anyway, you only need to have everything finished by, by the deadline. For the final assignment, uh, you should start it in, at the, the final session here, so uh, two weeks from now. Uh, and uh, we can talk about exactly what, what are the details, what's going to count for, for evaluation and so on, because this should be ideally part of uh, some work that you want to do with, uh, with Python, so that you're not duplicating your work and we can use part of that for grading. The, the only trick here is that uh, I can give you help in some things, but I cannot give you help in those things in which I'm going to grade you. I need to, we need to separate uh, those. So if you don't need grades, uh, it's not a problem. I can help you with whatever you need. If you need a grade, we need to reserve some, some hours of work just for grading uh, in, inside that project, and we should talk about this in the, the final session. So for the final assignment, you should include uh, a PDF file called report where I can read what is the idea and, and what you did. The source code should be also readable, have some documentation, we're going to talk about that. Uh, and you should have one script called test that I can use just to check if everything runs. Uh, for that, you may need to include some, some uh, data, but you don't need to include actual data. It's, it's just to check if the script runs. So if you have data that you still did not publish or something like that, you can just generate random values of, with the same kind of format uh, and use that just to show how things work. So I, I don't need to know exactly what your data is. I'm just going to grade the code and, and how the processing works. So let's go to the, the motiv motivation here. Uh, and uh, first, probably since you're here, you already have an, an idea of the advantages of, of learning to automate uh, data processing. But just to, to make this a bit more uh, specific, uh, also to understand how the course is, is structured, um, if we do uh, manual processing on the data, the result that we get is the result of processing the data. But uh, if you, we need to do it again, we don't have the, the actual mechanism for processing because that's what we're doing. Uh, it's also, uh, you cannot just repeat everything easily because you need to do it manually. And this uh, makes it subject to errors that are not reproducible. So you can make one mistake once, but then you make a different mistake on the second time. And it makes, harder to, uh, makes it harder to monitor uh, those mistakes. Also, you don't have necessarily a record of how the data was processed, unless you are very uh, careful about recording everything that you do, how you, you use the spreadsheet, how you wrote the formulas and things like that, then usually uh, there will be no record of how it was done. And if you have some experience in the lab, it's, it's often the case that there was some PhD student or postdoc that did some work, they went away, and now nobody knows how those data got there, they just have the results. Okay. So this is a problem with manual processing. If we automate things, then what we produce is the recipe for processing data. Then the actual processing is what the computer does, and we can just reuse the recipe whenever we want. This makes it easier for reusing and also uh, makes it less prone to random errors. It's not, uh, uh, we can still have errors, but usually the errors will occur always at the same kind of conditions and in the same way. So we can test for those errors first and check if everything is working. Uh, <coughs> finally, the, the code you write can document the process uh, that you're following. So uh, if anyone has uh, questions or doubts about how the data was processed, all you need to do is open the, the script and look at the code and you'll see exactly what the steps were. So this is one, uh, one of the reasons uh, I chose Python for this course, because Python is uh, uh, structured in a way that makes it easier for humans to read too. So it's not only for the computer, it serves as documentation. So it's a good language to use for this kind of, of uh, code where you can use the, the source code as a document on how things are processed. And another uh, a big advantage is that uh, usually you're going to have lots of 
tasks for processing data that are not quite the same, but they have some similarities because there are common elements in, in your different data sets and so on. So as you invest in writing code for processing, you start building up a, a tool set of different uh, parts of this process that you can reuse easily. So it becomes uh, growing increasingly more practical and more easy to uh, write these solutions. So we're going to uh, focus on the, this automation. É a única que não tem o. não tem a letra. <risos> So for this course, we're going to focus on uh, automating data processing on uh, your area of expertise. So you're not going to worry too much about how to design algorithms and how to think about the problems because we're going to assume that you already know how to solve your problems. You just need to know how to tell the computer to do those, those steps. So this is not a generic programming course, this is specifically for uh, people to learn how to translate what they already know into the computer's language for the computer to do. We're going to focus also on writing code that, it's easy, that is easy for humans to read. Remember that uh, part of our goal here is that the code is a document uh, uh, describing how we process the data. So it's important for the code to be able to, to be read by humans. Okay. Uh, and we're going to focus also on writing reusable code so that the effort you spend solving one problem is not solely for that problem, but when you come to a similar problem, you can reuse many of the solutions you already have and just adapt what you need or create a new, uh, uh, a new, bit, a new piece to uh, fit things together. So let's see what we're going to do to uh, solve these problems and how to write code. In general, the, the first step when we are writing code is to understand the problem. That's the only way we can think about how to tell the computer to do what we want. Then once we understand the problem, we need to figure out the algorithm. The, the algorithm is a, a name for a finite set of steps that produce the, the outcome that we want. So we need to figure out what the steps are. Then we need to usually decompose the, the, the task because it may be complex into smaller bits and repeat this for all the bits until we have all the pieces that we can fit together. Then we implement each of the pieces, test and start building the, the, the final solution. So we're going to focus on this part, implementation and test, because we're going to assume that you will be using uh, Python and, and programming to solve problems that you already know how they're going to be solved. Um, so this will be in a, in a generic uh, programming course, we would have to cover all of this. We're going to focus on implementation of uh, code to solve problems we already know how to solve. And to do that, we're going to need to uh, uh, understand how we can store data in, in our program how we can operate with the data, do something to the data, control when uh, different operations are done, and organize everything so we can uh, build things uh, in smaller pieces and fit them together. So this will be uh, basically the element we're going to look at uh, this morning. We're going to use variables of different types to store our data. We have operators to operate, to change the values on these variables. We have uh, control elements in the programming language to determine when things are done or how many times or in, in which conditions. And then we, uh, to be able to separate um, a complex problem into more elementary parts and implement them separately before we can join everything together, we're going to learn how to create functions, these uh, elementary blocks that then we can fit. So this will be uh, quite a bit of information this morning, but don't worry about 
trying to memorize the details. This is just to give you the pieces that we're going to use, and the idea is that you'll learn them by using them. So we're going to go, the, the, the subject matter that I'm going to talk about today, we're going to keep using it in all the sessions until the end of the course. So the idea is that you have three weeks to learn this part and not just today. I'm just going to show you everything today because if you don't have the basic elements, then there is nothing practical that we can do and I would not be able to, to show you examples or to show you how to use the libraries and so on until we get this part done with. Okay, so the idea is not that you memorize everything now, it's just that you have this roadmap, you know what the pieces are and then we we'll go back to this repeatedly. Uh, the next sessions we will focus on learning how to use those libraries that already have very useful code but every time we're going to use those for some application we will be reusing the basic elements of python so we're going to repeat this uh, over and over again so let's start with this basic concept of a variable uh, variable is uh, uh, you use the name of the variable to refer to something in memory to an object in memory uh, and it's called a variable because you can change what the, the name is referring to and the idea that this works is that we create a name for a variable and we tell the interpreter uh, the python interpreter this name and internally the interpreter will associate this name with an address in memory and put something in the address in that uh, memory re location so we what we assign to the variable get stored in the memory and we can access those uh, that data by using the name of the variable so we don't have to remember these addresses or what is there the interpreter will take care of that one important thing is that uh, everything that is stored in the computer is just a sequence of zeros and ones uh, actually it's the electric charges or magnetic fields or something like that but we can abstract that uh, for uh, zeros and ones so different things that we need to store will have to be, uh, there will also have to be some information for the interpreter to know what kind of thing we are storing. Because we may be storing numbers or text or something more complex like a function or other kinds of objects. Uh, and so the interpreter needs to know what kind of thing is there. And we have different syntax for uh, different things. Uh, the general uh, method uh, is always the same. We start by creating a name of a variable. So uh, a variable name needs to be, uh, uh, contains letters or numbers, but it cannot start with a number and cannot have spaces or, or punctuation signs or things like that. It can have an underscore for, to serve as a space, at least visually it's similar, uh, but you cannot split it into different words. And then we have this equals operator, which is the assignment operation, and some value. And what this does is tells the interpreter to create uh, in its variable dictionary this new entry, uh, choose some space in memory and store the value there. So different examples here are, for example, none. If you just want to create a name and don't have anything to store that, you can use none as, as one value. It's, it's nothing, no value. You can use numbers, integer or uh, fractionary. You can use string, list, tuples, and so on. So these are some examples. All of these are distinguished uh, by this syntactic element. So let's create a variable called nothing, which, to which we assign the value none. We can do it like this. We write the name of the variable, equal, and the value that's going to be assigned. So this creates the variable in memory, allocates space to store the value, and start it there. If you want to store numbers, you just write the numbers uh, as values and assign them to a variable. They are there are different types of numbers, so if, if there is no uh, decimal uh, point there, uh, it's stored as an integer. If there is a decimal point, it's stored as a floating point number, which has uh, a different representation uh, for, for the decimal parts and for, for the base. Uh, we're not going to go into detail there, but there is this representation has a fixed number of significant digits within uh, a broad range. So it's about 14 significant digits, something like that. Um, if you want to store text, a string, you can use the, the single quotes or the double quotes in the beginning and the end. 
you need to do this because if you if you write something for example this uh, variable equals and then you write some text without the quote the interpreter will try to figure out which variable that name is referring to if you put the quotes you're telling it's not the name of a variable it's exactly that uh, sequence of characters and that's the value that you want to store in the in the variable you can also create uh, sets of, of values uh, there are uh, three different kinds uh, here, uh, this list and tuple, lists uh, are ordered sets of values that you can change. You can add elements and remo remove elements and, and change elements there. Tuples are ordered sets of values that are not changeable. Once you create them, you cannot modify the contents of, of the tuple. We'll see uh, some uses for this, but one of the uses is to use as keys in dictionaries. Dictionaries are another useful uh, uh, set in which uh, there is no fixed ordering because it's optimized internally, but uh, there are pairs of keys and values. So it's something like a, a, an address or phone book or something like that. The first uh, element in each pair is the key, and the second one is the value, and you can access the value from the key. We're going to see some, some examples of this. So how you tell the interpreter which type of, of object here you're creating uh, is done by these syntactic elements. Lists are, are uh, sets of values separated by uh, commas and delimited by square brackets. Tuples are separated by commas and delimited by these uh, parentheses. And then dictionaries are delimited by curly brackets and the pairs are separated, so the elements of the pair are separated by the columns. You use key, column, uh, value, comma, and then you, you add others. Okay? So this is not something to memorize, but you can look up uh, the syntax every time you need. What I would like you to retain is the idea that you have these basic types of, of data that you can store. Uh, nothing, numbers, text, sets, ordered sets of values, and pairs of key values when you need to associate uh, different values. Okay. So these are the very basic uh, elements for Python. Then there are other more sophisticated ones that we're going to see that you can import with, with different libraries. So this is how we store the data. Now we need to do things to the data. So we have these operators, the usual ones there at the beginning plus, minus, multiplication, and division. So this is how uh, we indicate them. There's another type of division which has two, uh, two slashes, and this is integer division. So if you divide, for example, 5 by 3, you get 1.6666. If you do 5 slash slash 3, you get 1, which is the, the integer result, so minus the remainder. Okay. <coughs> You also can uh, use the, the two multiplications for explanation, so this is 4 raised to 2, 4 squared, and you can use these comparison uh, operators. These uh, return true or false depending on the, the logical value of the comparison. For example, 5 equal equal 2 will return false. Note that the comparison to ask the interpreter if two values are equal needs two equal signs, because when you use one equal sign, this is a different operator, it's the assignment to a variable. And actually, if you would do five equal two, you will get an error because you cannot assign anything to five. Five is a constant, it's not a name. Okay. Uh, so you can do uh, these uh, operations, uh, less than, less or equal. There's also this in, in is useful when you want to know if uh, one element belongs to a set of elements. Uh, so this is how you can uh, do operations with values and obtain some results. You can also uh, uh, combine these kinds of operations with uh, AND and OR. So conjunction, disjunction, you also have negation. So you don't need to memorize everything at once, but you can do these algebraic operations with uh, the values, and you also can do logical operations with, uh, with all these comparisons. Now let's see a simple example. We want to, to uh, compute the concentration of two grams of, of table salt 
in 100 millimeter of water, we can uh, write our code and save it as, as a file. So the things I'm going to show in yellow are those that you're going to see on the, the left side in Spider usually, which is the editor for the text file that you're, where you're writing the code. So this is what we save to, to the drive, uh, which has the source code for our program. Uh, the convention is that source code for Python has this extension .py. Uh, but this is a simple text file uh, that you write with Spider, or you can write with a, a simple text editor too, if you want. So here what we're doing is creating one variable called molar mass, and we are assigning it this value. This is the, the mass of one mole of, of table salt. Then this is the mass that we have in our solution, the volume, and we compute the concentration by dividing everything, and now we print out the concentration as a result. So this is the, the sequence of steps we want the interpreter to, to do. When we run this in Spider, you can do that with, by pressing F5, for example. It will automatically save any changes that you have in the script and execute the script in the console. The console, uh, by default, you see it in the lower right side. And what appears in the console, I will represent with this gray background. So this is uh, what you can do interactively or the output you get from your program. Okay? Uh, if you are using the, the console directly, then when you have any expression that returns a value and you do not assign it uh, to a variable, the console will echo the result. This is useful if you're doing things interactively and want to, to check the, the values that you have. In uh, your programs, when the interpreter is running your, your script, it will not echo anything, and the only output you'll see is the one that you explicitly tell the interpreter to, to display. And this you can do with the print function, and then put all what values you want to be represented, and they are output to the console. Uh, now, when you're using, this is just a simple example where you use uh, numerical values. Often you're going to use uh, vectors or values that are ordered set. The examples here are lists, tuples, and strings. Strings are also ordered sets of, of characters. And uh, when you use uh, an ordered set uh, of elements, you may want to pick a specific element inside the set. And this is the thing that you have. Uh, the name of, of your object that has a set, the, the variable, for example, and then you, inside square brackets you specify the index of the element that we want. Uh, one thing to remember is that indexes start at zero from the beginning. So if you have a string like this, this uh, L here has an index of zero, uh, the U has an index of one, and so forth. You can also uh, index counting from the end by using negative index value. So the last one is minus one, the one before last is minus two, and you can do it both ways, yes? Not for all programming. Most, uh, I think most languages start at zero, Python, C, and so forth. Uh, there are others like MATLAB, for example, start at one. Starting at one gives you some problems when you're computing the offsets of, so, so if, you, if you have one with a specific length and then you want the, the, the element following that, you have to keep adding plus one, plus one to, to lots of those uh, operations. So uh, starting at zero is less intuitive because we think about the first element as being one, but when you actually have to operate with, with this set, it's easier if you start at zero because it simplifies a lot of, of the calculations. So I think that most languages, most languages that are widely used start at zero. There are a few exceptions like, like MATLAB, for example. Uh, dictionaries are a bit different in that they don't have an ordered set of elements, but they have these they are essentially these tables where you look up the values from the key. So when you want to index a dictionary, you use one of the keys to get the value. So this is an example. We have this name here. If I get the second character in this string, uh, the, sorry, the character of index 2 in this string, this is actually the third character because uh, the first one is index 0, 1, 2. 
and so I get the D there. Uh, for this dictionary, I have these uh, associations of keys and values, and I access the values from using the keys. So if I uh, look for animal classes fly, then I get insect as the, the result because it looks up the, the value associated with the key. So basically, if you want to store an uh, uh, element in an ordered sequence, you can use lists or tuples. If you have strings, which is text, you can access parts of the string by the order of characters. If you want to pair uh, keys and values, you can use the dictionary. <coughs> Another uh, thing that you can do with ordered arrays is instead of getting one element only, you can get a slice. So if you get a subset of the, the original set by specifying the first point where you're going to cut, the last one, and this step, if you don't want all the elements, but say every other element, you can have a step two, so you're skipping one element, or a step three, or something like that. The thing to remember here is that the slice points, you can think of them as falling between the elements. So if we ask for the string between slice point one and three, we get these two uh, characters here, because we're cutting here between uh, these elements. Uh, here are some examples. So if I ask from this string the, uh, a subset from zero to three, the cutting, cutting point zero is at the beginning of, of the string. Cutting point three will be here between the third and fourth element. So I get this part of the string. I can ask for a subset like this. You can also omit uh, uh, some of these values. So if you omit the first one, uh, the interpreter will assume that you want to start from the beginning. If you omit the last one, it will assume that you want to go all the way to the end. And if you omit the step, it will assume that you want every element, so step one. So this is why I can do this. I can go from zero to three. I'm omitting the step, so the interpreter thinks it's step one and gives me all the characters. If I do it like this, I'm omitting the first and the last and only giving the step. So it's giving me every other character all the way to the end. And we can do all these combinations. For example, start with slice point one. I omit the end, so I'm going all the way to the end, but then I have a step of two, and so forth. Okay. So this is how you can, with ordered uh, arrays, these are lists, strings, and tuples. You cannot do this with a dictionary, because, because dictionaries don't have the, uh, a fixed order there. Uh, but with these kinds of arrays, you can do uh, this slicing operation. Okay. So once again, it, it's not, the idea is not to memorize how to do this. The important thing is that you remember that you can do this. So when you need to do something like this, you Google slicing in Python and you have lots of examples and then you figure out how to implement. But don't try to memorize this uh, uh, from the beginning exactly how to, to do slicing. You can also use slicing with negative uh, values uh, if you use negative values for the slice points you're counting from the end and if you use negative values for the step you're going uh, uh, you're reversing the the order so instead of going forward you can go backwards okay. <coughs> let's see uh, uh, an example here where we uh, do a computation that is a bit more complex and generate an ordered array for for the values so this is to solve a quadratic equation we're going to assume that this square root here, so this, this value here, b squared minus 4ac, is positive. And this is just the, the, uh, the expression for solving the quadratic equation. So we have uh, uh, a quadratic equation of this type, y equals to a uh, times x squared mi uh, plus bx plus c. And this is how we can get the, the two solutions. So let's start by uh, writing the a, b, and c uh, variables. In general, we should not name our variables like this, a, b, c, because then we don't know what they mean. So always try to give uh, descriptive names to your variables so it's easy to follow the code. The exception is when there is an actual expression that you're following and there is an actual convention calling the variables in this way. 
So it would make more confusion if we were to invent different names in this case because we're all used to writing the, the, the quadratic expression in this way. So in this case, we're actually going to call this A. Uh, B is going to be minus 3 because we have minus 3x there. C is going to be 1. And now we just write the, the expression. We're going to compute this delta here, what's inside the, the square root. So square of B minus 4AC. And now we can compute our solution. We have minus B, then delta, the square root of delta. So we raise it to 1 half to get the square root divided by 2a. Mm. This would be one solution with a minus there and the other one with the plus here. So we compute these two expressions and we put, it, we put them in the square bracket separated by a comma. So we are creating a list with the two solutions for the quadratic equation. Note that we, can, we don't need to do this step by step. So you can write, uh, tell the interpreter to compute this expression, then add it to this one, then divide by this one, and put this inside the list. You can do it all in the same line. There is, however, a trade-off between how compact your code will be and how easy it is to, to understand. So in theory, I could even have put every, uh, this thing here instead of the delta and, and write this longer and, uh, and skip this line. But then at some point it, it becomes hard to read and easier to make mistakes. So when you're de dealing with uh, uh, more complex expressions, it's usually best to break it down into simple steps so that you can uh, easily check if you're making mistakes. Also, if you have some value that you're going to reuse, it's a good idea to put it in a variable instead of comp copying the expression several times. Because if you have an error in the expression, you will only have one instance of that error that you need to fix instead of many of them. And if you forget, if you forget to fix one, then, then things will still go bad. So now we can test the result. Uh, if these are the correct solutions for our uh, equation, then uh, when we put these in uh, replacing the x, we should get something that is close to zero. So we can check here, this y1 and y2 are just the computation of the, the polynomial uh, for uh, the two roots of, of the curve. So how can we do that? We need to go uh, find the first solution here and use it as the x. So the first solution is solution index 0. We have this square bracket here, we're going to get the first one. So we replace this uh, for x there a times this value squared, b times this value plus c, and we do the same thing with the other elements of the list. So solution 1 in the second line, solution 0 on the first line. So now we can check, uh, we can run this, and we can check in the, the console uh, how things went. So if you write now solution, you have this variable, variable declared in memory, so you can see what were the two values uh, in that list. And if you want uh, y1 and y2, you, you see that they are zero. They may not be exactly zero. Sometimes there are rounding uh, errors here. But uh, uh, you can check if they are close enough to zero uh, to verify your solution. So this is uh, also uh, serves to illustrate one important aspect of writing code, which is testing things to see if they work. So you need to have uh, to run your code. It needs to run. But you also need to check if the result is correct, because sometimes we make mistakes and the result is not right, and we need to, to verify that. Now, we are assuming that this delta is greater than zero. If it's not, then these things are wrong. So one common problem in code is to check if some condition is true and do things differently depending on, on those conditions. And this we can do with this structure, with if. The basic, uh, most basic version of uh, the if statement is just if an expression that can be evaluated usually to true or false, this will be the condition, and then a block of code that will be executed if the condition evaluates to true. If the condition is not true and we have only this if statement, then this block of code will be ignored and the interpreter will skip that part. So you can create a block of code that is only executed if the condition is true, but is ignored if the condition is false. If you want to uh, have a branch of, on your code 
but guarantee that one of the, uh, the branches is executed, you can have a construction of the type if, else. So if the condition is true, this block of code is executed. If it's not, then the other block of code is executed. This way you can tell the interpreter to do either this or this. One of them will be done for sure, but never both. So only one uh, will be executed in that case. If you have a more complex problem where you have a branching of several different branches, you can use the if, l if, and then use lots of l if. l if is the contraction for else if. And basically, you're saying that if this condition is true, do this. Otherwise, check if this other condition is true. And if it's true, do that, and so on until the end. You can also include an else. In all of these cases, the interpreter will only execute one of the branches. As soon as one of the conditions is true, it will execute that block of code and jump to the end of the if. So the if statement is uh, uh, telling the interpreter to execute conditionally one of the branches we are specified, specifying, but never more than one of the branches. So as soon as one of them is executed, the if is key. If you include else, then you guarantee that one of the branches will be executed for sure. If you do not include else, else, then it may happen that none of the branches are executed if all the conditions are false. Okay. So let's use this here. Uh, first, we compute the delta. So we have uh, the A, B, and C previously defined. We can compute the, the delta value, so this value inside the square root. And now we check if we have real solutions for, for this equation. So if delta is less than zero, there are no real roots for, for this uh, curve, so, so no real solutions, and we create an empty list and assign it to our solution. So this is how you can create a list with no elements. It's still a list the, because of that syntax you're telling the interpreter to create a list, so the object is a list. You can add things and, and index and so on, but there is nothing there in this case. There are no solutions, the list is empty. L if means that if this, uh, this condition is false and this one is true, so if, if it's, uh, the interpreter reached here and this condition is true, so delta is greater than zero, then we have two uh, roots, so two solutions. And we write the expression as we had before. And now we have one left case, which is when delta is exactly zero. It's neither less than zero nor greater than zero. And in that case, we only have one solution. Because if uh, this part here is zero, then we only have minus b over 2a. And now we create a list with only one solution. So how can we use this script? Uh, this is a bit different from the other one, because here we are specifying what a, b, c is. But here we are not. So if we just run the script, we'll have an error when we reach this stage, because if b is not defined, then the interpreter cannot do that operation. It doesn't know what b is. So first, we can define a, b, and c. We'll assign its values. We'll assign the same value uh, I showed here. But I also take this opportunity to show uh, a neat trick that you can do in Python. If you have one ordered set of values here, you can put the same number of variables there separated by comma before the assignment operator, and the interpreter will unpack the values in order for your variables. So as long as the number of elements is the same as the number of variables, the interpreter can assign them in order. And this is a, a concise way of putting a 2 in A, a 3 in B, and 1 in C. We can use the, the tuple that we defined here and unpack it to the variables. So if we do this first, then we can run the script. We press F5, because now these variables exist in memory, and the interpreter can do those operations. So this is also an example of how we can generalize the code. Note that this script here could only solve this equation. If we wanted to solve another equation, we would actually have to change the code to do that, because we would need to change the values of the variables. This script here can solve for any equation. What we need is first define the appropriate variables, give it the, the right values, and then run the script. And we can solve any equation, quadratic equation, uh, with that script. So this is a more general version that receives 
the, the values in this way. Uh, so we can test it with different examples. For example, here we have the first one, 2 minus 3, 1. Here we have another one, so this is uh, 2x squared plus x plus 1. This has no uh, uh, real solution. And then we have this one, which is simply x squared, has only one uh, solution at 0. Okay. We have here minus 0, but this, this happens when you're dealing with uh, floating point numbers because we have a finite representation in memory. It's actually 64 bits. And when you're doing uh, square roots, for example, if you have the square root of 2, you cannot represent the square root of 2 in a finite number of digits. So you'll always have rounding errors, and you can have uh, small rounding errors uh, in this case. Okay. So this is an example of how we could write the code to make it uh, solve any quadratic equation. We just have to assign the appropriate values to the variables before running the script. Yeah, the, the, this tuple is a constant. So this cannot change because we're just writing it. It is, always has this value because uh, uh, we are writing the numbers, writing things as a tuple. But when we do this, we're uh, uh, telling the interpreter to unpack this set into the three variables and assign the value to the variable. So what the interpreter will do is assign uh, to the variable A, the value 1, to the variable B, the value 0, and the variable C, the value 0. But the variables are variable because we can always change what the variables are referring to. So if you have, uh, for example, this A equals 5, then A will no longer have 1, it will be assigned 5, and the 1 will go, will go away. Okay? So this is constant, but the variables, the values can be changed. And that's how things work here. We start by assigning 2, uh, minus 3, and 0. But then when we do this again, we change the values in the variables. So 2 is always 2, 1 is always 1, but b is whatever we tell it to be, OK? Yes, uh, which is what I'm going to show <laughs> right now. OK, so this is what we, we can do. This is another control element for, uh, for our program. So you see, uh, in this case, we were doing the same thing over and over again. If you want to do the same thing a number of times, you can tell the interpreter precisely that. Do this a number of times. And this you can do with the for uh, statement. The for statement starts with for. Uh, a name for a variable, it should be a new variable so that it doesn't interfere with others that you have, in something that is iterable. So well, we're not going to go into much detail here, but an iterable is uh, typically an object that has a set of elements. So all those sets we saw, uh, tuples, lists, strings, and uh, dictionaries, can, uh, are iterable and can be used in, in this uh, loop. There are other things that we can use too, but we'll see them later. And what this does is this block of code that we include here, and uh, as you saw here, uh, the way we tell the interpreter that where the block of code belongs is by the indentation. So it's always the same uh, syntax for all cases. Uh, you have uh, a block of code starts with this uh, column here, then you have an indentation, and the interpreter knows it ended when it goes back to the original indentation. So in this case, we have this indented line belongs to this if branch, this one belongs to the else branch, and this one to the else branch. The same thing for uh, the, the for loop. You have uh, for a variable in some interval, uh, a column there, and then indented code that will be run several times. And what the interpreter will do is for each element in the interval, each one will be assigned to the variable, or the variable will point to each element in turn. And for each of those iterations, the whole block of code is executed. So in this case, year will point to 1991. 
and this block of code will be executed. Then here we'll point to 1994, the block of code will be executed, and so on until the end of the set. And the result we get is this, the, a repetition of these prints with different years because we have the variable there and it's pointing to different elements in the list. So we can use this to uh, solve a set of quadratic equations. We create a list of tuples in this case. So these, uh, these are the three quadratic equations that we use here. And we put them all in the same list. And now we put everything that we did inside the for loop. So for uh, coefficient in the equation, this variable coefficient will point first to this tuple then the second iteration to this one, and the third iteration to this one. Now we can unpack the tuple of the coefficients into A, B, C, because this variable is pointing to a tuple of three values, and we, when we assign that to A, B, C, the interpreter will distribute the values in the three variables. And now the rest is the same, but note that everything is indented. So here we have uh, our script is all adjusted there to, to the, the left, but now this part is on the left, but everything here is indented because it all belongs to the for loop. So this is what is repeated for each of the tuples in the list. And this is everything. It checks the, 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 the delta, right, uh, builds the solution, and prints. So we get the three uh, responses there. Okay? Solution is uh, empty, string, empty list, the two values, and one value. Okay, so now there is a problem here with this script. Uh, there are some advantages to doing this thing because it's very simple. You're just writing the recipe and everything in one go in a list. But thing, things start uh, getting complicated because first, we don't have a, a proper control of the input. The way we can do this is either by defining the variables in the console before running the script, or having the actual values in the script, which is not very practical either way, because we need to know what the variable names are, and we need to put them in the right order, and so forth. We also don't have a proper control of the output. We can print things out, but then we cannot use them. Uh, for example, here, suppose that we needed to use these values for some other problem, but we would no longer have them, because they, they were being replaced in all the iterations. <coughs> and uh, we don't have isolation of variables. There is a problem if you use uh, the same variable again in other parts of the code, you replace the value that you had before. If you know what you're doing, then okay, uh, it, it works uh, fine, but at some point you start increasing the number of values and uh, the variables and the possible collisions of the variables start increasing quadratically because the more variables you have, the more likely you have that, that you reuse the same name uh, in the wrong place. So this is another problem if we're trying to uh, solve complex problems. We start getting too much complexity in a single script and then things break down. So this, these are the problems that functions are meant to solve. Functions control the input. We specify the parameters that receive values control the output, we specify what comes out of the function, and isolate the code. So all the variable names inside the function are only real, only exist inside the function. If there are things with the same names outside, they don't collide because they live in different universes. Okay? So this is how we create a function in Python. A function is also an object, like a list, a tuple, a string, all of these are objects in Python, and we create them uh, as a function using this def statement. We uh, follow the def statement with the, the name of the function and then always uh, parentheses, open and close parentheses. If the function does not receive any values, you just put the, the parentheses. If the function needs to receive values, which is often the case, then you need to provide the names of the local variables where the values will be stored. So these are the parameters. The parameters are the, the parking spaces for the values. So they need to be variable names. You cannot put anything there that is not a valid variable name. Then you have the, the column all, always uh, to define the initial, uh, the start of a code block. And now you have the indentation to specify what belongs to the function. 
Usually, we want to write uh, a documentation for the function because there is a, a useful uh, function that you can use, which is help. If you type help and between parentheses the name of some function or module, you get the documentation for that. So if you write a string right after the, the, the first line, this will be used as a documentation for the function and can help you if you don't remember how the function works or if someone else is going to use, they just have to type help and, and see this. They don't have to go look into the code. And you can create strings with more than one line by starting and ending with three delimiters. If you use just one, as we, we saw uh, in these previous examples, you cannot break the line. You need to finish the, the string in the same line. So with one delimiter, either a double uh, quotation mark or a single quotation mark, you need to finish everything in the same line. If you want to create a string that is a block of text with several lines, you can start with three and end with the same three delimiters. They can be either single quotation or double quotation marks. So this would be the documentation of the, the, the function. We're going to solve the quadratic equation using the values we received there for A, B, and C. Now we have the same code here. Uh, this is all indented to tell the interpreter that it belongs to the function. But we have one extra line here, return. Uh, Return statement tells the interpreter to exit the function. So usually you'll find the return statement at the end, but sometimes it can be in the middle if there is some condition where you want to exit immediately. So as soon as the interpreter encounters a return statement, it will exit the function and return to whoever called the function. Whatever you put after the return statement, you can put several uh, values separated by commas. These will be the values the function will return. So if it's one, it will be that value. If it's more than one, it will be a tuple with all the values. And this way, the, the function object can be, valid, uh, can be evaluated as an expression. For example, if you write soft quadratic and then in, in parentheses the values for A, B, and C, this will be evaluated by running everything and will take the value of whatever is returned. So this will be the value of this expression and you can use this in other operations uh, or assign it to a variable or something like that. And you can use now the function to solve different uh, uh, equations. So what's the advantage here? Not only we uh, no longer need to know what the names of the variables are inside, we just need to know what the order of, of the values we need to, to send there. We don't need to worry about the names of the variables here because they exist inside the function. Even if you have other things here with the same names, they don't interfere because they have different namespaces. And the, the value that the function is computing is not just going to be printed out on the console, but it's actually returned here. So you can, you can uh, fit the function with other operations and then uh, chain everything together reusing the, the result. So this is going to be the, the main element that we will be creating. Everything we're going to write will be functions and then fitting things together. If uh, you have the documentation, you can use this help uh, and the name of the function and it will give you uh, the, the documentation. Now, uh, a little detail here is that first, you need to actually run your code in order to create the function in memory. Note that this is just like a variable. It will be stored in memory. It will be referred this object, which is the function, which is a special object that you can execute, but it works just like any other variable. So only after the interpreter executes the, the def code, this block, will you have the function in memory that you can use. In addition, there are two ways of referring to the, the function. If you just use the name of the function, you're just telling the interpreter it's this object, the function object. This is what you do, for example, when you want help on the function. You want help on this object here, and the help function will get the documentation. Another thing that you can do with the function that you cannot do with other types is execute it, because the function is also a recipe for doing something. And executing the function, you need to use this syntax. Following the name of the function, you need to open and close parentheses. In general, since the function needs to receive values, you always need to include those values in the, the parentheses. 
So the values you put here are the arguments that are going to be uh, placed in the parameters of the function. But even if the function does not need any values, if you want to tell the interpreter to execute the function, you need the parentheses there, because the parentheses are the sign execute this function and not merely a reference to the, the function. So think of the function as an object that is in memory. It has documentation, variables, code, and so forth. You can refer to it by name, just like any other variable. But if you want the interpreter to execute the code, then you need to uh, follow the name with the parentheses. Okay? So uh, let's see here an example of, of the isolation. We have this delta variable here. If we run execute the function, it will do all these computations, including computing the delta. And now if you want to know what value is stored in the delta, we get this error. The interpreter does not know what delta is. And the reason for this is that delta only existed inside the function. So not only it's not accessible from the outside, it's probably not even in memory anymore because as soon as the function terminated, the, those variables were, uh, were disposed of. So in any case, you cannot access variables inside the function from outside of the function unless you speci specially declare them to be global in the function, but we're not going to do that because that breaks the, the isolation. You can do things the other way around. The function can look at variables that are outside, but you cannot uh, uh, change or access variables inside the function. You can also create a variable here called delta, for example, delta zero. You can solve this equation. This equation has a delta greater than zero. It has two uh, solutions here. So the, the function will create a delta variable, it will be greater than zero, it will do all the operations, but delta here will continue to be zero. Because even though they have the same name, they are not the same delta. One exists inside the function, the other uh, is what we have here. So this is a, a very important uh, feature of functions, because sometimes it uh, creates some confusion because uh, for example, you can write here solution, you don't put a return, and then you're expecting to have a solution outside here, but that won't work because the purpose of creating those function blocks is specifically, one of the purposes is to isolate the code from the rest. Okay, so remember, what happens in the function stays in the function, except what you, say, uh, what you have here in return. And even the return only returns the value, not the variable name. So uh, this tells the interpreter to return the value in memory that is, is associated to this name solution. But the name is all belongs to the function. The value can then be uh, exported here or placed in another variable, something like that. Yes. So if you want also delta to come out, you put solution comma delta, and this will return a tuple with the two things, with the, the list and the, and the delta. Okay. But the, the actual name delta will not come out, only the value that is stored there, because then outside you can put it in some other name. Okay. So now we can write everything and include some tests. This would be our script. We can include com uh, documentation for the module, for the script itself. We have the, the uh, function here, and now some tests. Uh, we get the test solution by solving this uh, quadratic equation, and then we get the y values that should be close to zero by, going, by trying the two different solutions that we get. So this is an example of how you can write the function and also include some tests in your script, so you can, if you do some changes, uh, you can check if everything is working again, or uh, if you update your code, and so on. So it's a good idea to include tests in our script. And just to recap, the important feature of functions is to isolate code. You get this abstract recipe that you can reuse for different values because you're controlling what uh, go comes in and goes out. And because the code is isolated and you can control the input and the output, you can think of uh, functions as pieces of a puzzle that you can then fit together to build uh, more complex uh, programs. You don't have to worry about how they work inside because they don't interfere with each other. You just have to worry about what comes in and goes out of each function in order that they fit together. 
To create functions, we have this def statement. This is executable code that creates the function in memory, just like with other variables or other objects that we use. Uh, so it, you must execute the code to, to create your function. Some of you, maybe, who have experience with MATLAB, you're used to having the function in a file, and as long as it's in a file, then you don't need to do anything else. But, but that's not how Python works. You don't have one function per file. You can have several functions in the same module, and they are created when the, the code is executed. Okay? <coughs> to use functions, you use the name of the function followed by the parentheses. Even if there are no arguments given, you need the parentheses to tell the interpreter to execute the function. You can pass the argument by position or by the name of the parameters. We'll see some, some examples later. And uh, the return statement immediately exits the function uh, and gives you the, the uh, and uh, exports whatever values you have there. If you have a return statement without uh, any values, or if you have a function without a return statement, then uh, if there, are, there is no return statement when the code uh, when the interpreter finishes running, executing the function, it will return none, that empty value. If you have a return statement with no value, it will return none too as soon as it encounters the statement. So the function always returns something, only it may be a none value. So let's do a, a small exercise here. We're going to play a bit with this uh, uh, dictionary. We're going to uh, create a dictionary with capitals and, uh, and countries. So we have the country for each capital. And then create a, a function that returns the capital of the country with the longest name. Let's uh, do this for an example of, of if and for and so on. So I'm going to do this here. Hope I don't make too many mistakes. But also uh, mistakes sometimes are useful. So maybe if I make a few, it will be good. So the first thing you do is you start Spider. This depends on your operating system. If you have Windows, you probably go to uh, something to search and you type Spider. Um, if you have Linux, you can just try Spider or whatever. Now this is not what we're going to do, so I'm going to create a new file. Uh, I'm going to put this a bit larger. So uh, all of you tried this. Okay. Uh, this. Uh, on this side, you have uh, the editor for your source code. The source code uh, you store in files, and you can edit here and keep it stored in the, in the hard drive. So the first thing you can do is you do, for example, save as, and now you choose um, a place to, to put your, uh, your file. Just create here a temporary directory. Okay. And now you can uh, call it something. So keep the uh, .py extension. This is a convention for, for Python uh, source code. And uh, we now have everything saved. So These first two lines here, you probably only have one of them. So this is a, a um, a special directive for for uh, the the shell in Linux that uh, tells the operating system what uh, program will use this script. So it's basically pointing to Python if we want to execute the script. In Windows, you you won't have that because Windows works a bit differently. But you'll have this second line probably. This is a a directive for the um, interpreter to expect this file to be coded in UTF-8. This allows us to use uh, special characters like, like tils or, or the C with the, with the CDL, I don't know how to say that in English, and so on. So, uh, but uh, uh, just leave it like that. Don't, uh, uh, don't change that, because then uh, things might not work very well. Then you have here uh, the documentation for the module, which you can edit. So you see you have three uh, double quotes there, three double quotes here. Everything inside here is a string that can use, that serves as documentation for the model. So we can put this exercise for dictionaries or whatever. You can just write whatever you want. Okay, so now we have this, um, this dictionary here that we're going to create and start uh, for as an example. 
and you can already run the code. If you uh, press there, run file, or press F5, you see this happening here. Uh, this will make Spider give this command to the console to run the file in this folder. So this is the exercise file, and to run it inside this folder. This uh, will not be relevant for this exercise, but when we start working with files, it's useful if you store everything in the same folder, so the code and the files, because then you just access the files by their name. You don't need to give the, the whole path. And for that to work, you have to run your code at least once, so that the, the uh, spider will change to the right uh, folder. If you want to check which folder you have, uh, sorry, you have this uh, present working directory, p. Uh, WD will tell you what folder you're working with, in, and if you use LF, you can list the files in that folder. So if you have problems with some file you're not found or something like that, you can check to see if you're in the right folder and you have, have the files there. But for this uh, exercise, it's not a problem yet, but we can already see that since we ran our code, we have the capital uh, uh, dictionary here. Okay. So if you write capitals in the console, you're asking for the value in that variable, but you're not doing anything with it. So if you don't do anything with it, the console echoes the value and tells you what's inside the, the variable. If you do something with it, then there is no echo. For example, A equals capital. This is done silently because the, the console assumes that you just wanted to put A referring to the same dictionary, and now A also refers to the same dictionary. So now, what we want to do is create a function that will receive a dictionary like this, and give us the key, or in this case the capital, for the country with the longest name. But we can... No, because the capitals are the keys. So if you have capital, if you put the capital as a key, what you get is the information on the capital. And the information associated but is... Actually, uh, in, in this table, the output is... Uh, and then, did, did you run... Did you run your code? Okay. No. Mm -hmm. okay. Some things only work when I'm nearby. If I'm away, then they <laughs> sometimes it happens. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how computers work. <laughs> so uh, what we want to do here is a function that will output the uh, capital for the country with the longest name. But we can abstract from this particular problem and, and think of this more generically. We want a function that returns the key of a dictionary for the longest value. And this can be with countries, with animals, with whatever. And this is a, a, a useful trick. When you're trying to solve a problem, think about how you can generalize, because that makes the function more useful in more uh, different cases. Okay? So let's create a function uh, key longest value. This is a strange function, probably will never be used outside this exercise, but we can create this name to specify uh, what the function does. And we receive a dictionary. So uh, let's call it dictionary, and uh, we need this column here. So you, you'll uh, see that if, uh, if you have uh, written like this, then you get this warning here that you have an invalid syntax. Because when you start to define a function, you always need to finish with the, the column. That's the, what specifies the, the start of a block. Then, if you do this, you get a warning here that you, uh, the interpreter was expected an indented block because that would be the body of the function, and it's not finding that, so it's giving you a warning. But we can start here, we can describe our function, return uh, key for longest value in argument, something like that. 
And now, we need to think about how we're going to implement this. So the idea is that we're going to go through all the entries in the dictionary, and we're going to keep always the one corresponding to the longest value. So one thing that we can do to find the length of any uh, set of items is to use this len function. For example, the len of this tuple is 3, the len of uh, some string, like this, it's the number of characters in the string, and so on. So the len function tells you how many elements there, there are in one set. So you can also do len of capital, and this tells you that we have three entries in that dictionary. So this is one way we can check the length of, uh, uh, in this case, the values associated to our keys. Note that we are assuming that the values are set, because uh, if you try to find the length of 4, for example, you get an error because 4 is a number and it's not a set, so it has no length. Okay? Uh, this is how we can find the length of each of them. And wh what we need to do is to, follow, uh, to loop through all the entries in the dictionary and store the largest one. So we have here a for loop. We need to loop through all the, the uh, elements of the dictionary. And we also need to check whether or not we have found a longer version, uh, a longer entry, relative to the last one we found. So we'll need an if uh, to do that. And the idea will be that uh, we'll start for uh, any key in the dictionary. Now, by the way, you can check. If you don't know what happens when you loop, loop through a dictionary, it's easy to check. Let's do here for x in capital. And we do print x. Uh, you'll see that if you do this in the console, since I'm writing a block of code, the, in, the console is not running my code yet, because it doesn't know when the code block will end. And it's waiting with those uh, uh, dotted, dots there. It will execute when you input an empty line. So if I do enter again, now it will know the code is finished, and it will execute. So, if we do a for loop in uh, a list, a tuple, or a string, we loop through all the elements. If we do a for loop in a dictionary, we loop through all the keys of the dictionary. So, what we're lo it's like looking up the names of people in a phone book or something like that. We're looking at, at the keys, and if we want the value, we have to go get the value from the key. So, this is what happens with and this is also one of the things you can do when you're, you're not sure what happens, just experiment and see the result. You won't break anything, so you can experiment uh, what, uh, however you want. So let's do this here. For key in dictionary, we will get the value is dictionary, and we access it by key. So we can try that out here, for example. Let's do this. We can do this capital X. If we do uh, like this, what we are printing is the value associated with each key. So now instead of getting the capitals, which are the keys, we get the countries, which are the values associated to the cap with the capitals. So we get the value, and now we need to check if this value is longer than whatever we had before. So we need to think about how to implement this. Let's say the longest one, we start with none, because we don't know what it is, and the, the maximum length so far starts at zero. This is so that uh, uh, the first time we encounter something that is longer than zero, we will store it, but then we'll only store it if it increases the length. And this would be our algorithm here. If the length of this value is greater than the maximum length so far, then we're going to replace the longest with th this value, and we're going to replace the maximum length with the length of the current value. So let's see what happens here. Every time we encounter something that is longer than the longest we have met so far, we can increase the, we can replace the longest that we have stored, and we can replace the maximum length that we found. If we start with the maximum length at zero, this 
can work. We can also simplify this a bit. Uh, well, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, is everyone following this, this reasoning? Okay, so let's test this this way, and, and then we can fiddle a bit with the code. So basically we have these two variables. One keeps the longest value, the value that has the, the longest length, and the other keeps the, the actual length, so we can compare with the length of the new value. And we keep changing these every time we encounter a, a longer value. But only when we encounter a longer value, because if we find something that is shorter, we don't want to replace it, because we don't want to uh, ruin what we did so far. So now, in the end, we return the longest we found. So this would be our function. Okay? Uh, we execute everything, and now we can experiment our function to find the key for the longest value using our capitals dictionary. Capital. Okay, so now we have uh, United Key. So uh, if we want to uh, um, test this a bit more, we can add a new entry to our dictionary. To add an, an entry to the dictionary, we can uh, index something that does not exist where. So, uh, some, some polys will be the capital, and we'll assign it a, val a value, for example, uh, some, uh, where is some, I don't know if it's longer than United Kingdom. Okay, let's put a bit more. <laughs> uh, so now we have uh, a new entry here in the dictionary. You can change values inside the dictionary, for example, capital uh, London, and we put in UK. So this way we can change what is assigned to the, the key, and if we assign to a key that does not exist in the dictionary, it will be added to the dictionary. So we can also do for example, Madrid, Spain. So this is how you can uh, uh, change things in the dictionary. There are also methods to remove uh, uh, entries from the dictionary and so on, but uh, you can, uh, one, use, one very useful way of, of building dictionaries is to start with an empty dictionary and then loop through some data set and add everything into the dictionary. So the, for this example, we're doing things by hand, but usually we will load the data into the dictionary from, from some other part. Okay, so now we can test again our function. And now the result is different because now we have this other capital uh, for this other country with a, a, a larger name. We could also uh, look at our code and see that it's a bit complex. We could, instead of starting with a length of zero and a value of none, we can start with an empty string that has a length of zero, do away with this max len uh, variable that is unnecessary, and we compare the length of the new value to the length of the longest so far. So this could be a change we could do to our code to make it a bit simpler. Instead of having two variables to describe the longest one, the longest length and the, and the value itself, we can just keep the value and then compare the length. This change of none for an empty string was just so that the length function works, because you cannot ask for the length of none, none does not exist. But the length of an empty string is zero, and so this should work. So now we can test again our function, and we can run these different, uh, sorry. So uh, this, by the way, was a, a good example. You see, what I did was to run everything here, and then I tested the function again, and I got United Kingdom. So, when I did the test before, I was getting this somewhere in Tandem, and now I'm getting United Kingdom. So, what happened here? Yeah, but, but I, I replaced it with UK, see? I had done this with the, with the capitals. 
I added Madrid, I changed the United Kingdom to the UK, and so on. Yes. So now, capitals is again as it was in the original, because when I ran my script, this was also executed here. So everything that was in capitals was replaced by this dictionary here. Okay? So remember this, when you run everything, you run all the code there, and you can change the, the variables if you have them in your script. So this is just a simple example of how to create a function, do the if, do fors, create variables, and so on, and also for you to see how to work with, with Spider. Yes? Uh, do you have a question? Sorry? Ah, okay. But the, the, the idea here, uh, you, can, you can go back to this example and, and we can do it in the tutorial. But this, this part is, is just a demo for you to, to get the general idea. So it, it's best if you uh, uh, look at the general idea of how I'm doing things now, and if you have questions, ask, and then try to do by yourself. Uh, that way you're thinking about the actual code. Because if you're just following and, and writing, then basically you're only exercising typing because you're just uh, uh, reproducing what you're seeing and not trying to actually think about the code. So I would suggest that you can go back to this example and then try to do it on your own and that will exercise the right the right muscles for programming, okay? Yeah, well, this, uh, uh, for example, if I do it like this, yes, faces are also characters. So if you have this, uh, and then you try the longest one, you get that string. So each space is also a character there. Okay. Yes, you just, uh, in the dictionary, capital, you get a new entry, for example, Madrid, and you assign a value to that. And now you have a new entry here. So this is this is also what you can do to change uh, the value that you have. For example, like this, you change the value that is assigned to the key. So if the key does not exist, it will create a new entry. If it exists, it will replace the value. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at this a bit more uh, in abstract, well, uh, what actually is being stored in all these functions and variables, uh, all the names that we create and all the values that we use. Python is an object-oriented uh, programming language, so everything here are objects. And objects are a mix of code and uh, values. So, uh, Objects that you create, for example, a string object, have codes associated with that string. So you can think of the object as a mini program that has specific functions that you can call. And the functions that belong to an object are called the methods of the object, are accessed with these points here, the dot, and then the name of the function. This is telling the interpreter to use the split function from the soup object. So soup is a string, string has a split function, and you can use the, the function from the object. This is useful because since the object has data, in this case it has the, the actual string, the functions, the methods of the object will operate over that data. So you don't need to keep sending the data to the function, you just use the function belonging to the object. In this case, the split function re receives as an argument a string, and it will break the string uh, uh, which is, the, uh, is in the object that executes this method by uh, splitting it wherever it finds this substring. And it will return a list of strings with all the fragments in between. So basically it will delete all the commas, break things down in all the commas and return the, that list of strings. Another useful method for strings is upper. It will return a copy of the string but in uppercase. 
starts with checks if the string starts with that substring uh, and so on. So you have many different methods and the, the usefulness here is that you can think of the string object as a mini program that stores the string and also has lots of functions that you can use to operate on the string that is stored in that object. And this is the general philosophy of, of everything in Python. Everything are, are objects, all the values are objects that include these uh, these uh, uh, functions. Different objects have different uh, methods. Um, for example, for a list, you have uh, uh, elements, for, uh, methods for adding elements, removing elements, and so on. Uh, and so there are different uh, um, uh, different objects can have lots of different methods. But we're going to see those uh, gradually. Now I'm going to to give you a, a, a more complex example. Uh, just to stitch things together and give you a, a broader overview of how this thing works. So the idea of these examples that I'm going to give is mostly so that you can follow them later at home because you have the, the lecture and everything in the, in the notes and you can go through more complex examples slowly and this will help you uh, um, bring things together and, and check if you understand all the elements and so on. Another idea is that uh, we don't waste time with toy problems that are not realistic and will not be useful. So this is a bit more painful in this way, but at least we focus on something that you can use. Because if we're going to look only at examples like that, capitals, dictionary, and so on, there is no point in that because we don't see what we're going to do with that uh, in a real application. So this... Uh, um, I confess that many of my examples are biased towards biochemistry because that's my background. I try to di diversify a bit, but most, m many times I will fall into this. Uh, and so here we have um, uh, pro uh, files for protein structures from Protein Data Bank. If you're not into biochemistry, don't worry too much about this. They are basically just files with lists of atoms and their positions and the, the, the chemical elements, the residues of amino acids that each atom belongs to. Um, so what we're going to do is we have an input file with a list of file names, and we want to read that input file, read all those different files, and output a, a, a file which has for each of these uh, protein structures, where we have all the, the atoms and their coordinates, we want to output the total uh, mass, of that, that protein, and the length, which is the longest distance between any two atoms, so how, how large the, the protein is. Now this is, uh, for each uh, of these files, we have the, the atoms and the coordinates, and we can check the documentation for the file format, because these, uh, the atoms are specified in lines that start with atom, and then all of this information is in specific positions of the line. So this is uh, all spaces, the x, y, and z coordinates are always in these uh, columns here. And then we have the, the amino acid residue the atom belongs to, and the identifier for the, the residue, the type of atom, and so on. So we know where the, the information is in each line that starts with atom. There are other lines that don't start with atom, but we don't care about those. There is other information in the, in the file. So, what we're going to do is we're going to read the input file with the list of PDB files to use. For each of that, those PDB files, we will get the coordinates of all the atoms and the list of the amino acid residues that we have in the file. So, it's important to note that there are several atoms for each amino acid residue, but there is a unique identifier for each residue. So, we know that this uh, serine is residue 1, alanine is residue 2, and so on. So we can, we can check when, we ch when that number changes, we have a new uh, residue. <coughs> we need to add the total mass from all the residues, measure the length of the protein, and then write the report file. So this would be the, the breakdown of the algorithm, and we can implement this into different functions. So this would be how we decompose the problem. We, th we think about what we have to do, and the, the different things that we need to do is we need to be able to list all the different residues in the PDB file by looking at their identifiers. We need to get the masses somewhere, so we can write, uh, have a, in memory a dictionary that tells us for each three-letter code what will be the mass of that residue. 
we need to add all the uh, to uh, get the mass of the protein by adding for all the residues get also the list of coordinates for all atoms measure their distances and then write the report file so we can outline the functions that we'll need to write in this way before we actually plan the, the program. So this will be a bit more complicated than, than the example we saw so far, but we should do this with these seven functions. One function to list the residues, all this function needs is the, the name of the, or the, the source of the PDB file, so all the strings in the PDB file, where it will look through uh, to find the residues and list all the residues. So this PDB source will be a list with all the lines of text in the PDB file, and it will return a list with uh, the different residues. Then the, the math dictionary, we don't know what to put in to this function because it will have to read the residue masses from a specific file. It's not going to be a general thing, but it will return the dictionary with the three letter code uh, as key and the mass of each residue as value. To get the mass for the protein, we need to uh, know the, um, uh, the text of the PDB file, so this is the source here, and also the dictionary with the masses. So if we receive this into this function, we can ask that function for the list, and then we can ask that, uh, we can get that, uh, use the dictionary we got from that function to uh, compute the, the different methods. So basically what we're doing here is we are specifying what each function does, what it needs to receive an output, and checking if we can do this with the functions that we are uh, planning. If you see that something is missing that we cannot do, then we'll need to add a new function and, and work things out and plan out the program in this way. So now we also need to list all the coordinates we just need the, the source for the PDB file and find the x, y, z coordinates for all atoms. And to get the maximum distance, we need some function to compute the distance between two points, and then a function that will get uh, a list of points and find the maximum distance between any pair of points there. So this would be a, a generic way of trying to find the longest distance inside the, the project. And finally, when we have all these pieces of the puzzle, we can put everything together in this last function. So this last function has the name of the input file, the name of the output file, and we will use the other to gather the information and report everything. So this is the first step for trying to solve a more complex problem. Before we start actually implementing functions, we think about what each function will do, check if they all fit together, assuming they were properly implemented, and now we have the first outline of the program. Because now we can focus on testing and implementing each function without worrying about the, the, the broad picture, because we know what each function is doing. If you try to start implementing a function before, before figuring out where it will fit, then it will be very confusing. You don't know what the function has to do, what it has to return, and, and it's impossible to tell the, the interpreter to do something if you don't know exactly what you need it to do. So, this way, we can also figure out that, for example, uh, the function that computes the mass of the protein needs to know what are the residues or the amino acid residues in the protein. So it will need to use that function first before adding everything, and it will also need to receive the mass dictionary, so we will need to have this function working in order to get that dictionary. This is another thing that we need to do, is to figure out what, uh, what is the order of the implementation of the function. So you start, let's say, by this one. This one uh, is easy. We, it just receives the PDB file, the, the source of the PDB file, and gets the, the list of, of residues. <coughs> so we're to list the residues, we need to go through all the lines in the PDB file, check for those that start with atoms, and uh, if the line starts with atom, we follow through the identifier for the residue. Every time the identifier changes, we have a new residue and we keep adding it to the list. It's best to look at the identifiers because it may happen that we have two residues of the same type in sequence. And if we are just looking at the types, then we'll make a mistake. But the identifiers are unique for each position along the protein, and so we can use that. Okay. Uh, 
So this is what we expect, uh, uh, our function is we expect to receive a list with all these strings, with all these lines from the file. Uh, so this is the PDB source there. And now we're going to look through all these lines. And for each line, we're going to check if it starts with an atom. This is easy to do because we have a method for the string that can do this. Start with, and we give it that substring. So if this expression is true, if the line starts with an atom, we'll get the name of the residue from this slice of the string. It's always in the same position. So you can check the, the position. It's there from slice point 17 to 20. And we get the identifier from this part here. So this would be line from 22 to 26. Now here is a, a detail. When you slice a part of a string, you always also get a string. So you get something like space, space, one. This is a string. But what we want is to look at the number itself and not as a string. But we can do that with this function, int. We'll change whatever we put there into an integer if it's possible to do that. If you put something that does not make sense as an integer, it will give you an exception, an error. But other, otherwise, it will return the integer corresponding to here. So what we're doing is we're cutting away this part or copying this part of the string and converting this to a, an actual number. And this will be the name of the residue and the identifier of the residue. And now we check if the identifier of the residue is not the same as the old one. So not equal is uh, an exclamation point, the negation and, and the equal. This means it's different. And if this identifier is different from the old one, it means that we went from one line like this to a line like this. So it changed the residue. If we are moving in lines like this, where the identifier is the same, then this expression uh, here will be false, and this block of code will be ignored. But if it's different, then this expression is true, and this block of code will be executed. And what we want to do here is to add the new residue to a list of residues. And we can do that by creating an empty list uh, here. So this is a, a list object, but it has nothing yet. But the list object also has its own method. They are not the same as the string, but one very useful one is append. Append is a method for adding elements at the end of a list. So this is something we can do here. We will append to the list of residues the name of the residue we find. So for example, serene here as S-E-R, we put that into the list, and we update the identifier of the last residue that we put there. This is important so that when we reach the second line of the same residue, we will ignore that one, because we don't want to put twice uh, the, the residues there, or four times, or something like that. So this is how the loop works. We check. So let's start here at the beginning. This one has an ID of 1. It has an ID of 1, it's equal to the old one, so this line is keep, this block of code. But now we get to this alanine with ID 2. Since 2 is not equal to 1, this line will be executed and we append the alanine to the list. But now suppose that we left the old ID in, at 1 the same, we didn't change it. So in that case, when we went to this line here, the new ID would be 2, but the old one would still be 1. And so this would be again true, and we, we would put Alan in twice in the list incorrectly. So when we put a new residue into the list, we have to update the old ID so that we know that if we find the same ID over and over again, it's still the same residue and we are not putting it on the list. So now, what we need to do is to guarantee that this works for the first residue, because this works fine for the second onward, but to work for the first one, we need to put something on the old ID that is guaranteed to be different uh, from the, the first one here. So one thing is we put none. None is, is a special value of nothing, so it will be different from whatever integer we find there. Or we could put a negative value if we are sure there are no negative values in the integer. Uh, identifiers, uh, and so on. So this would be 
the function for getting the list of different residues in our protein, receiving the list of lines from the PDB file. Now we need to know how to get the lines from the text file, but that is very easy. This open uh, function in Python receives the name of a text file. You can use that usually for text files, but if it's a text file, you, you give it the name of the file, and then uh, it gives you an object that has access to the file. And this object has a useful method, which is read lines, that gives you all the lines of text in a file as a list of strings. So it just breaks the file into uh, the text file into lines and gives you the list of strings. So this is all that we need to, to read the file into a list of strings. And now we give this list of strings into the function, and the function returns a new list of strings that uh, basically receives this list of strings and returns the list of strings with the, uh, the amino acid residues for the, uh, the process. If I want to, to check the first five residues, I can do this. The, I, I store the result of the list residues function in ResList, and then I ask for ResList and the first five elements, and I get the first five, or the last five, if I want to check with the PDB file if, if everything is working. So you should check with the files to see if you're getting the, the correct result. So this is the, the first function to get the list of residues. Now we need to know the mass of each residue. So we go on Google, we find some web page like this that has uh, the one letter code, the three letter code, the chemical formula and the, the mass uh, for the, the average of the, the isotope. Uh, or if it was monoisotopic, but we will use the, the average one here. And so we have this on a web page, and if we look at the source code of the web page, you see something like this. This seems uh, complicated, but this is basically HTML. We have the, the table of the, the um, uh, data there. We have these TR tags are the table rows. So this one TR is each row here and these PD are the, the, the different cells. You don't actually need to know this to understand the, uh, the HTML. You just need a little pa a bit of patience if you want to extract this information, because you can look at the regularities here. So you see that you have this uh, description of the type of font and so on on this cell here, which is the A, and then the, the ALA here, and then the, the, the formula, the masses, and then this repeats always in the same uh, sequence, because the structure is always the same. So what you really need to know to, in order to do this is to know that HTML is just a text file with, with these tags, and that you can download the HTML and then work with it uh, using Python. So if you don't know that's possible, then you'll never figure out how to do it. But if you know it's possible, then it's just a matter of looking at the details and work out how to extract the information you need. So this is a bit uh, complicated for this kind of example, but the goal here is to give you something that is realistic, to show that, that you can actually do. You don't need to, uh, to have something pre-digested in order for it to work. So let's see. Uh, cell start with this TD tag, and the content is always after the specification of the font size. Font size something, and then we have the content that we want. And it's always in the same order. It's the one-letter code, three-letter code, formula, math, and average math. And it repeats like this. So we can use split uh, on the string to separate the different bits that we want. Um, and we can also iterate through all these lines. I'll show you this, uh, this range uh, uh, class, this range uh, to get a, an iterator. But basically, what range does is you can uh, give it an integer number, and it will give you the, that number of steps, or that number of numbers starting at zero. So if you ask for five, it's zero, one, two, three, four. This gives you basically the indexes to go through a list, or a tuple, or any ordered set, because it gives you the list of the elements in a set with this number of elements. So this is useful if you want to look through the, the indexes of uh, a set. And the land function, we already saw it gives you the number of elements in the set. So let's see how we can digest this, uh, uh, this uh, HTML file. 
we can open the HTML file and read all the lines. Now we have the uh, list of strings with all these different lines. This is one string, another string, and so on, all the lines of the HTML. Now we can go through all these lines and check which one starts with the, the TD tag. So these are the cells for the, the, um, uh, the table. When we find one, we split at this font size here. So we are going to delete this part and break the, the string into two. This part on this side and this part on this side. Now we take the second part. So see, this will be a list of strings because we are breaking and we have a list of several strings. And now we're going to take the second string because the second string is this part here. This part, we don't care about it. It has no useful information. But this part here is what has the value that we want right at the beginning. So if we break this part now with the, the uh, lesser than sign, which indicates this tag, we can isolate the value that we want there. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to split again by this uh, less than uh, font. Uh, we're going to split the second fragment that we got here. So now, this uh, second split uh, will be a list that will have uh, this part and then whatever happens later, because maybe this font appears again, we don't care. But it's, it's a list that has at least this, uh, the part that we want at the beginning. And so we get that one here. We get the first fragment from this second split, and this is the value that we care about. So if we do this for all the lines, we'll get a list with A, A, C, and 71, 71, R, R, C, and so on. And we'll get all of these in order. So now we can get the three-letter code by jumping five, uh, in steps of five and starting with the second one here. So the first one is a one-letter code. We start with the second, and we go five, 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 and so on, and we get all the three-letter codes of all the, the amino acids this way. Because we had the list with all these values in, in order, and we are jumping every five values. And we can do that with this slide. Start with the second, go to the end in steps of five. And we can do the same thing for the masses there. We'll start with the fifth one, and we go to the end in step of, in step of five. So the fifth one is the one of index four. Remember that index is start at zero, and then we jump five uh, steps of five. So we go from a list with all these values in order to two lists, with one with the three-letter code, and the other with the uh, uh, masses. So now we create a dictionary. We start with an empty dictionary, and for uh, this uh, variable i in uh, the indexes of uh, one of these lists, so this list should have the same length because they have the same number of entries. So we take one. The length of the first one is the number of amino acids that we have. Range with that number will give us 0, 1, 2, up to that number. Not including the number, we'll start before, but we get all the indexes of that list, starting at 0. So suppose the list had 5, we would get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which would be the, the indexes of an array of 5 elements. So why uh, this i uh, variable here is iterating through all the indexes of one of these lists, doesn't matter which. But it, since the values, the corresponding values are in the same position, we can create a dictionary that has as keys the, uh, the values that we get from the list of the, the amino acid name, the three letter code, and associate it uh, with the value that we get from the mass, because it's the same. The, the uh, uh, residue, the amino acid of index zero, has the mass of index 0. The amino acid of index 1 has the mass of index 1, and so forth. So this is what we're doing here. The, the three-letter code is... Uh, range, you... you okay. okay, here. So we're giving the range function the number of elements in the array. So this is the length of one of these lists. They should have the same number because it's the number of amino acids on the table. And range will give an interval that will go from 0 and 
or, or through that number of elements. So if this is 10, it goes from 0 to 9, which are the indexes of that array. For example, an array of five elements has these indexes. Index 0, index 1, 2, 3, 4. Because the first one has index 0, the last one is one below the total number of elements. Okay? So this allows us to loop through uh, all the indexes of this array with this variable i. So i starts at 0, then 1, 2, and so on, until the end of the array. Okay? The position, yes. Yes, but the reason why I'm using this one is because I want to match the first uh, entry in this list, in the code, to the first entry in the map. Okay, so the first entry of the code goes with the first entry of the map. The second one on the code goes with the second one on the map, and so forth. So this is the, the first entry on the code, this is Allah here, goes with the first entry of the map, which is 71 something. The second one on the code, which is R uh, ARD, goes with this second map, and so forth. So I have to, to synchronize the two of them. That's why I need to look through the index, so I can use the same index for the key and for the value. So the key of this dictionary entry will be the code of index I, and the value associated will be the map of index I. Now there is uh, an additional trick here. I'm going to change the code to uppercase because uh, in the PDB file they are all uppercase and in this table they start with uppercase but then they have lowercase. So I change everything to uppercase here. And I also convert this string with the, with the text for the map into a floating point. Float is the same as the int we saw before but for numbers that have the decimal point. But the important part here is that I match the first code with the first mass, the second code with the second mass, the third code with the third mass, and so on. That's why I'm looping through these indexes, so that val 0 goes with mass 0, and code 1 goes with code 1, and so on, okay? Because otherwise I wouldn't be able to, to put them in the right uh, match. Now, uh, this first split will give me a list of strings that have this part before the, the cut and this part after the cut, okay? But I want the second of those fragments because the first one is irrelevant. The second one is the one that has the value. So I'm going to split the second fragment, not the first one. And then when I split the second fragment to remove what's at the end that I don't care about, then I will retain the first fragment of that split. So basically, I split at something that's before what I want, and I take the second fragment that goes after the split. And then I split uh, uh, something that is after what I want, and I take the first fragment because that's the part that I care about. Ah, okay. So now we can test this. Uh, we call math dictionary. Note that this function does not have an argument because it only works for this file. So it's, it wouldn't be useful to give it, say, the file name or something like that because then it wouldn't work if the file was different. So we need to have this file in our folder and use exactly this function uh, like this. But we still have to put the parentheses because that tells the interpreter we want to execute the function. We are not just na using the name, we want the function to be run. So now the function returns the dictionary and we can check. We have this in the dictionary and we can check the, the mass of each residue this way. So now we need to add all the masses uh, for to, to get the mass of a protein. And now things get a lot simpler because we have the pieces together. We already have a function that gives us the, the dictionary, so we get the dictionary uh, first, and we send it into this function. We also send to this function the, all the lines of the PDB file, so this function will call the first one, this residue, uh, sorry, this one here, 
uh, to list all the residues. This one we already tested, so we get the list of all the residues, and now we look through all the residues and add the mass of each one. To get the mass of the residue, we just use the name of the residue in the dictionary, and out comes the, the mass that is uh, associated with that one. Now, there is just a little detail here because these are the masses of the residues inside the protein. We have one oxygen and one hydrogen at one end and, and uh, an hydrogen at the other. So we just add that initial mass, but this is just biochemistry stuff. It's not uh, that important here. The important part is that we start with the value. This is a, um, something that is very used if you want to add things up. We start with a value. Often it's zero. Sometimes for some reason, maybe it's not. but we add, assign that value to a variable. And now we look through all the, the terms that we want to sum, and we keep summing into the same variable. And to do that, we create an expression that uses the, the value that's already in the variable. We add something there, and we store everything back into the variable. This is a strange exp uh, expression if you're thinking about equals as uh, in an equation, because it would not be possible. But this is not an equation. This is an assignment operation. So what you're telling the interpreter to do is to evaluate this expression and store it in that place. So variables are like drawers where you put uh, the values. And so you can keep adding things into the total mass by keep using the total mass into the expression and putting it back in the same variable. So now this looks through all the, the residues, adds everything up, and returns the mass of uh, a protein. To test this, we just need to uh, open the, the file with open and read all the lines. So we have a list of strings with all the text in the, the PDB file. And we send this into the PDB math function along with this dictionary that we already got before. So this is the, the dictionary the, the function needs. And as long as we give it both of them, it will give us the total math. So this takes care of the math. Now we need to find the length of the, the protein. This is a similar thing that we did for the, the amino acids, but it's simpler because each line that starts with an atom, with atoms, has a different atom. So we don't need to check if they are repeated because they are never repeated. All we need to do is, if it starts with an atom, we take the x value from this part of the, the string, the y value, and the z value. So this is the, uh, what we had here x, y, z, we get all these values, and we must remember to convert them into numbers. Remember that when we, you extract something from a string, it's a string, we, you need to convert it to number in order to be able to do calculations with that. So we get x, y, z, we, we uh, convert this into a tuple, or we, we sort this out into a tuple, and we append the tuple into this list. So we get, as uh, a result, a list of tuples with the coordinates. Now here, this is a good illustration of the difference between lists and tuples. Tuples, you cannot change, you cannot add or uh, uh, subtract or remove elements from tuples. So they are often used when the position is important. If you have x, y, and z, and you, you remove one, then you don't know what the others mean anymore, because you don't know which they are. So it's a good idea to use tuples and you're representing something in which the, the meaning depends on the position. But if you have a list of coordinates, they're all coordinates. You can remove some, add some, you just have more or less coordinates, but they all mean the same. So in that case, it's useful to have a list. And also, in this case, it's necessary because we have to build it gradually. You have to keep adding, appending things to that list. So this is one example of the difference, at least conceptually, between tuples and lists. Another big difference is that you can only use as keys for a dictionary something that doesn't change, because if it changes, then it messes the, the dictionary. And so tuples can be used as keys in the dictionary, but keys, uh, uh, lists cannot. Tuples and strings don't change, lists same change, so they cannot be used as keys. But they can be used as values. Values, you can put whatever you want. But anyway, this is just a simple function that uh, gathers the coordinates, puts everything in a list of tuples, and now we have the coordinates for the, the protein. Again, we, we load, we read all the files, we send the, the list of strings into this function, and this function gives us the, the list of coordinates. 
uh, we can check the values, the first values and the last five values. You can, we can look at the file to see if they are correct. We should also always do this kind of, of testing. Uh, and now we need to compute distance. So we write a simple function to compute distance between two points. Each point is a tuple of x, y, z coordinates. So we can unpack each one into x1, y1, z1, and, and the, the other one. And just, then just compute the Euclidean distance. So uh, we do the difference squared for each uh, coordinate, uh, for each pair of values, and then sum everything and do the square root, and we get the distance between the two points. So this would be an auxiliary function that we also test, and we can now compute the distance between any two points. And now we can just look through uh, everything and compute all the distances between all the pairs. Actually, we don't need to compute all the pairs because if we compute point 0.1 to point 0.2, then we don't need to go point 0.2 to point 0.1 again because the distance is the same. So we can shorten things a bit by using, again, the range uh, uh, function. And uh, we can do it like this. Um, we receive a list of points, and we can assume the maximum distance. Let's start with a number that is uh, guaranteed to be lower than whatever value we're going to find. So let's start with minus one. Distance cannot be negative, so this is uh, guaranteed to be lower. And now, every time we find a distance that is larger than the one we found so far, we change this value. This is similar to what we did with the capitals and, and the countries. Every time we find a larger one, we update the value until at the end, we get the largest value uh, of all. And now, what we have to do is we're going to compare one point to another point, and we're going to loop through all the pairs of points. So basically, we need to, to do two loops, run through all the points, and for each one, go through all the other points uh, to measure the distance. And we have these two loops here, one four and another four inside the first one. So you can do this because uh, we are telling Python that everything that is indented is inside the loop. So for each value here, it's going to do the whole loop inside and it's going to do the product of the, the number of steps. So if there are 100 steps here and 100 steps here, this is a total of 10,000 steps because for each one of the first one, it's going to do all of the second one. So what the loops are going to be are first, the outer loop is going to start from zero and go all the way until the one before last point. It's not going to go to the last point because the last point will no longer have anything to compare to, but it will stop before the last point. And the second loop will start at the next point and go to the end. So point number one will be compared with point two, three, four until the end. Point number two will be with three, four and so on. And we'll do that because we don't need to repeat the distances. If we already did point number two with point number three, when we're doing point number three, we don't need to compute with point number two again, because it will be the same distance. So this is another use of range. If you put one value into range, it starts at zero and stops before reaching uh, the, the top value. If you put two values in range, it will start on the first one and stop before reaching uh, the, the, next, the second value. So we can do... Uh, iterate through 0, 1, 2, and so on until the, the penultimate index. And we can uh, iterate through the next value here until the end. So P1 starts at 0 and stops before the end. P2 starts at P1 plus 1, the next one to check, and goes all the way to the end. Now we get the distance by calling the other function here. One, uh, the first argument will be the point at index P1, and the second argument will be point at, in at index P2. And if this distance is greater than the maximum so far, we just change the maximum so far. So if you find a distance of 5, we update that to 5, then 10, we update to 10, and we keep doing that. And it, at the end of these loops, this will have the largest distance of all. And so we return that distance. Now we can check, we can give a list of, of different points and check if the, the distance is correct and do some tests first. And then we put everything together into one file, into one function. So this function receives the, the input file with the list of PDB files and the name of the file to output everything. 
we first start by reading the dictionary of the, the residue masses that we're going to need. We're going to read all the lines in the input file. This gives us a list of the PDB files we need to process. So this is the, uh, I have this here. Okay, so this is the input file with all the files we need to process. And now for each file in that input file, we're going to do all the processing. Uh, we're going to get the, the lines of the file. We're going to uh, compute the mass for the protein, the maximum distance, and then write to the output file. Now here is a, a, a little detail. In order to write to the output file, we need to have access to that file. So we're going to use open again, but this time we're going to specify that we want to write to the file. So by default, open reads give you read access to the file, and you can just read the whole thing and ignore the object. It will then be, be disposed of by the interpreter. But if you want to write to the file, you have to specify that you want to write, and we keep the object that gives access to the file, so that we can write to the file uh, whatever times we, we need. So now we're going to start by writing the header uh, here. So this header PDB file, mass and length, we're going to write that to the file. So we're going to write PDV file, mass, length, and this slash T is a special code to insert the tab character, those that we use for, for aligning tables. So uh, this uh, backslash T is a tab character. This back, backslash N is a new line character. It changes the line. So remember that in the computer, everything is just a series of bytes. So the text file is actually a series of characters. The text editor knows that the line has changed because it encounters this special character that indicates that the line has changed. So if you want to write the text file with uh, a line changing, you just put that backslash N, and that's where it will indicate that you have a new line. Okay, so now we set up the file for writing. We need to uh, read the PDB file. And here we have a, a, a small problem that when we uh, read all the lines from the input file, so this file here, this is the text that we see, but there is that special character for the line change at the end. It must be there, otherwise the file would not look like this. The text file would not look like this. It would not change lines. So when we read these lines, we have at the end this special character for the line change. And if we try to open a file with that name, we'll get an error because the file does not have that special character in the name. But one useful function, in, uh, uh, in useful method for the string object is this strip method, which removes all white space from the extremities of the strings. So if you have tab characters or space or, or line changes or things like that, it will just delete them. Not if, you, if it's inside the strings, but if it's at the end, it will remove them. And this is useful when you're dealing with text files because often you get things that are not visible but, but they are there on the string and you, you need to clean them up. So first we clean up the name of the file for each of the, the, the names we read for on the, the input file. And then we read all the lines from that PDB file. We compute the mass, the length, and now we write to the, the output file like this. Now, another detail, if you check, when you do the, these computations, you get lots of decimal points, because it depends on the number. So we computed the, the, the mass here, we get something like this. We computed the distance here, we get uh, something that is very long, and so forth. So what we want uh, now here on the file is something that is a bit neater, which only has two decimal points. But we have uh, in Python some, uh, a useful uh, way of doing that, a very practical way of doing that, which is using the format method for a string. So all strings have the format method, but format is useful when you specify a string that has a pattern where you want to put in your value. Now, this is something that you, don't, you should not try to memorize because you just look up on Google when you want to use. But basically, the syntax is like this. You have whatever you want on the string, for example, a tab here, a tab here, a new line there. And then you have, in curly brackets, the places where the values will be placed in the string. 
and you have a number indicating the index of the argument of format. So curly bracket 0 is where you're going to put the first value there. Curly brackets 1 is the second, curly brackets 2 is the third. And then you can add some special formatting code. For example, this dot 2f means a floating point number with two decimal places. And this will be converted into the string with that format. So don't try to memorize the format, but remember that you have this format method on the string. And if you Google format Python string or something like that, uh, you'll get this. So what we're doing here is putting the name of the file as the first argument, then a tab, then the math as a floating point number with two decimal places, and then the length as a floating point number with two decimal places, and whatever is between here, these, uh, these values, gets put there exactly as it's specified. So if you want to include text or some special separator or something like that, you can just format this uh, in whatever way you want. So this is done for each of the, the files and it's going to output each of these lines, it's going to write each of these lines into the output file. So we use the output file write method to add each line to the file. Then one important thing that you should not forget when you write files, always remember to close them when you finish writing because this tells the operating system that you've done writing, it will flush all the buffers into the file and the file then becomes accessible to other processes. If you don't do this, then you probably won't be able to see anything in the file because it's still waiting for, uh, for the process to finish. So this is the general outline, and it's also uh, an example of how you solve problems. Look at the, the initial problem uh, seems uh, a bit complex. We needed to do all of these things, but we decomposed everything into functions. When we were implementing each one, we were only thinking about that particular function. And when we had the toolbox ready, then to actually put everything together, we just need to call the right functions in order, and we have a simple final script or function that does everything. So this is, uh, this, oh, I can only illustrate this with a more realistic problem, because if we use very simple type problems, you don't realize how this is going to be set up. But the idea of this example is not that you already know how to do things like this after this lecture. But this is something that you can follow at home, do it uh, at your own speed, well, depending on what previous experience you have, and try to understand the most important part, which is not all these details that you can easily Google and see how they're done, but actually this kind of, of uh, computational reasoning by which you decompose a problem, solve the particular parts, and then fit them together uh, to get a solution. This is a lot more important than the actual details, because as you practice, the details will come in automatically. This is the part that you really have to pay attention to in order to, to be able to work with it. So to sum up this painful introduction, so this is basically like a, a, a test. So some people don't come in the next, <laughs> in the, the, the second session, because this really determines uh, how they feel about learning uh, Python. But don't be too scared about the details. There are lots of details, but they are not. The idea is not that you learn everything now. It's just that when you you practice this, you know that you already saw this somewhere. You can look up at the, the slides or or the notes or something like that because it's not the first time that you, that you find. The basic idea here is that you need to understand the how things fit together, how you can control execution, separate things into function. Uh, loop things uh, and so forth and in particular that you know that it's possible to do it even if you don't remember how you know you can do it and so you you google it or, or look up how it's done that's really the most important because if you don't know it can be done then you'll never find out how to do it uh, remember these basic principles how to organize the code how to think about the problem in decomposing everything into detail because this is something that we are not used to doing, is to work with something that is extremely powerful but extremely dumb. The computer doesn't understand anything that we want. It only does what we tell it to do in detail. So you need to really go down to that level and specify everything into detail. Uh, also, try to write your code so that it's clear to understand uh, when you go look at it or someone else looks at it and understands what it says. 
and this is something that you really need to practice in order to, to do it. So don't worry too much about trying to memorize things. Try just to practice and to, to do some, make up some problems and to play with it and so on. The more you practice, the easier it gets and uh, the faster then you solve new problems. Okay? So you have uh, the slides and the lecture notes that you can follow. The online documentation for Python is here and you have also the, the basically I covered 19 chapters of the book, so it's quite a lot of, of, uh, of uh, things. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, in practice, what you'll do is you're online and you use Google. So if you don't remember how to do something, Google and you see an example of code. So if you get to the point where you can look at code and understand what's there and adapt what you need, then you can solve any problem uh, with, with Python. So that, that's our goal here. It's not that you'll be able to sit at an exam and do this from, from memory. Okay.